So Jonah over here is four and a half years old. He's waving to you. Yep, go ahead, Jonah, you can wait. And um, a couple weeks ago, he was shopping with mom at the grocery store. And uh, they were, he likes to ride either in the front of the, the cart like a bumper or on the side like he's threatening to tip it over. And they were on this particular day and at this particular time going down the cereal aisle when Jonah looked over and said, Mom, pointed to a box of cereal over there and said, Mom, I think we should get that one. And it happened to be one of those high fiber, good for you cereals, cardboardy type things. So Amy said to him, oh, Jonah, I'm, I'm not so sure you're gonna like that. He says, and he pointed to it because it had the heart healthy, you know, heart sign on it. He points to it and he says, yes, I will. It has love in it. For several weeks now, during our time together, we've been exploring in depth what it means for Jesus to call himself the bread of life. We've been working through these wonderful passages in the sixth chapter of John as Jesus explores and, 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 and sort of plays with our understanding of, of bread and of what happens as we gather together. And he's been taking delight in playing with expectations. He's been standing on the beach talking to crowds of folks that he has just literally fed with a little boy's lunch. Thousands of people fed with one little boy's lunch with barley loaves and fish. And he's been, uh, it seems like, deliberately playing with his, their understandings of bread, the literal bread versus this, what he means when he says. And he's been exploring for us he calls himself the bread of life, the bread which comes down from heaven. He's connecting himself with manna in the desert that the Israelites had um, back at the Exodus. He's been talking about life. And then, of course, that challenging phrase that we've been hearing, he says, those who chew on my flesh and drink my blood have life in them. And today, as we wrap up this exploration, Jesus has moved from the beach to the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a little town right there at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And it is the hometown of Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John. And Matthew tells us that Jesus himself has moved from Nazareth to settle there. So this is a town that Jesus knows well, and they know him. And since he's such a devout practicing Jew, he would know this synagogue and he'd be familiar and comfortable there. Jesus knew the community and the life of the community, their patterns, their traditions, and their history. And in this synagogue, we can picture him gathered there with all the folks. I read last night that we have, uh, we've excavated the, the ruins of this synagogue and it had three foot thick walls, what would that be, like this? Made from the local rock and uh, we can picture him there with all the people. And just like our worship space, the synagogue in his day was the heart of the liturgical life of the community. This was the place where history was retold, where the community gathered to remember. Every year on a yearly cycle, they read and recited and remembered these astonishing things, the powerful acts of God for their ancestors and for their history. And as they retold them and remembered, they reconnected themselves into God's, as God's chosen people. So this is a community that's shaped by remembering and by rehearsing and reciting. And in the middle of them stands Jesus, this upstart rabbi, and he announces to them that remembering the past is not sufficient to carry the blessing of God for his people. Remembering the past is not sufficient to carry the amount of blessing that God has and intends for his people. And think how shocking that would have been. 
in the Hebrew scriptures, telling and retelling the mighty acts of God are a commandment of God. And these are people who have been shaped and formed by this retelling and remembering. These stories handed down and retold. They would know them from the inside out. They would know Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam. They told and retold the stories of the Exodus going through the Red Sea, manna in the wilderness, Joshua and Jericho and coming into the promised land. And Jesus stands up and says, simply retelling and remembering the past doesn't, is not enough to carry the blessing of God. And uh, we notice that um, when he does this, he's pretty rude about it, actually. He's really kind of snarky. He says, yes, God gave your ancestors manna in the wilderness, and it was wonderful, and they died. He says, yes, God brought your people out of Egypt, and they died. He says, yes, God led your ancestors in the wilderness, and they died. He's not very kind here, but he's pointing out something important, and he offers to them something new under the sun. He says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood and all that wonderful language we've been enjoying over these past weeks, he offers to them a living, intimate relationship ongoing with the creator of the universe. He says, those who chew on my flesh and drink my blood have life in them. They live in me, I live in them, and because I live in the Father, they too will live forever as a gift he offers for us and for the world, flesh and blood. The world Jesus loves enough to die for. Now, remember that his disciples and the people listening have not been through Easter yet. Remember, they haven't been through Holy Week. They haven't had the Last Supper. They haven't seen Jesus die on the cross and come back. And they don't have, as we do, this gift of several thousand years of understanding that Jesus is in with and under bread and wine. Luther basically, Luther leads us to say, you know, this looks, tastes, smells, and feels like bread, but Jesus says he's in there somewhere, and that's enough for us. And together, we've had this chance to get used to, um, in some, get used to the idea of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood because we know that's what happens here. We don't understand how. But we know that's what happens here. But remember, the disciples don't have that gift. What they see is Jesus standing before them and the specter of having to chew on his arm, and they say, whoa, this is a hard teaching. These are tough words. Who is able to hear these. And the reality is, Jesus really does have a lot of tough words, doesn't he? As we read through our Gospels, reading in our Bible, and looking for those things printed in red, Jesus has tough things to say, and this isn't the only one. Listen to some of the things that Jesus said to us. He said, you lack one thing. Sell it all, give it to the poor, come and follow me. These are tough words, aren't they? Listen to what Jesus said. No one can pursue God and stuff at the same time. Oh, these are hard words. Listen to what Jesus said. Stuff and money 
having them and having enough of them is going to make living in heaven as hard as if you had to thread a camel through the eye of a needle. These are hard words. And I'm pretty sure Jesus was serious about them. Because I can't think of a time when he was not. Jesus does not always give us light and easy words, but he challenges us and gives us hard teachings. Teachings that we struggle with too, just like those disciples in this gospel. And together, with Simon Peter, the only thing we can hold on to, the only thing we need, is to know who said them. Because we have come to know and believe that Jesus is the Holy One. Together we have come to know and believe, we have experienced that he offers something that we cannot find every, anywhere else. And I know that you have looked because I have too. Only Jesus holds and offers life. You can look everywhere else and nobody else has words that give life, even tough words that have life in them. The only thing we need to know and what we hold fast to is the one who said these tough words, and that is Jesus is the one that said them. Now, in our first reading today, Joshua presented with a rather stark fact of human existence, and it's one that's not very popular. He reminded us and said, part of being human is you got to serve someone. Now, in our country and in our culture, we like to pride ourselves on being individuals, about rugged individualism, self-made people, bootstraps and pulling up and all that stuff. We like to pride ourselves on freedom, which we often think is freedom from. And so this idea that being human means you got to serve someone or something is going to sound a little weird. But think for a second about where we ourselves and where we see people putting their time and their energy, what they pursue. Careers, family, influence, a big house, or what I might call the i-gods, like iPod, iPad, iPhone, I want, I need, or the biggest one, and I think the most dangerous one, is I deserve. Whatever we pursue, we are serving. Whatever we put our time and energy into, we are Serving In Joshua's day, they had sort of shorthand for that. That's why he can say, choose you then this day who you will serve. The gods of your ancestors that they worship back in Egypt, the gods of the Amorites, those, it's shorthand for the same idea. But he says, you got to choose. You got to serve somebody. And then what Joshua says speaks to us too, because he says, since you got to serve somebody, why not choose to serve the one who gives life? Why not choose to serve the one who has these words with life in them? Why not choose to serve the one who challenges us, but who does so because he loves us first? Why not fall in love with the one who loved us first? Why not choose the one who chose us? Why not choose Jesus, the one who loves us first and best? Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Why not choose life? It's 
So one more story about Jonah. And I got his permission. He said I could tell stories about him today. So Jonah's four and a half, and he's been coming up to the altar rail since, well, before he was born, he was still coming up here. But he's been at the altar rail, and he's been receiving communion with us for a long time. And, and, and for a long time, Amy and I were not quite sure what he got, if anything, from it. Because we'd put the bread in his hand, and he, he'd smile up at us, and then he'd go, Kow! And he'd get back to his seat and sit there and turn to Amy and say, Mommy, I want more snack. So we had some concerns, and we had some questions. And it was last November, um, Jono had this habit for a while. Whenever we put the bread, he'd receive the bread, he'd turn to Amy and say, Mommy, what's this? Well, that's bread. And receive the little cup, and Mommy, what's this? It's grape juice. So last November, he came up with Amy and uh, was standing, standing on the cushion at the rail. And uh, Pastor Erica gave him bread, and he turned to Amy and said, Mommy, what's this? And Amy said, it's bread. He said, no. He says, no. He said, God's love is in it. Now, for some reason, Amy thought that I put him up to this. I can't imagine why she would think that. So she asked him, well, Jonah, who told you that? Did Daddy tell you that? He says, no. Well, did Mrs. Kemmerer tell you that in Sunday school? He said, no. She, Amy said, well, who told you that? He says, I don't know. God? Bread of life from heaven. With God's life in it, given for us and for the sake of the world. The gift of God for us and for the whole world with God's love in it. Come to the table. Come and receive this gift. Come and receive bread and wine, flesh and blood, Come and know that the only thing necessary is for us to know. God's love is in it. Thanks be to God.